Hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode of AV Art Club, where we talk to artists and creatives about what they're up to. My name is Lauren Piemont. And I'm Chris Clamp. Today we have a very special guest. We have the amazing artist Tom Stanley. Tom and I have become great friends through the years. I attended Winthrop University. At the time he was the gallery director and he also taught a few classes. He's an amazing artist and was a huge inspiration. He's become a huge mentor to me in many parts of my life and is one of my closest friends. This conversation is incredible. I think you're going to love it. So please enjoy. Thank you. Tom Stanley, um, it's great to have you here today. Um, so Tom, you and I met in Rock Hill at Winthrop University, but I know that you've had a very long, very interesting path within your artistic career. Um, but would you like to give us like a, a good kind of um, just introduction of yourself, maybe um, where you were born and um, and kind of that, that path, and we'll then kind of dive into some of the details. Uh, sure, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, well, I, I, my father was in the Army when I was born, so I was born in Fort Hood, Texas, and I don't think we lived there very long. I don't recall anything about it. We moved from there to Fort Knox, still in the Army, and then he left the Army, and we moved to Charlotte very briefly, and then Harrisburg, and then Concord. Concord, North Carolina was, uh, you know, first through 12th grade. So my memories of childhood and formative years exist mainly in Concord, which was uh, where it was. It, it, Concord's the home of the Marching Spiders. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's much better than the, the fighting blue hens. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was, uh, it, it was what it was. From there, I went to college in Belmont Abbey, mainly because my brother went there. And um, you, you had to take art classes at the sister school, which was Sacred Heart. So since I really didn't want to take science, I eventually transferred to Sacred Heart, which destroyed everything. I think that's why the school eventually closed. But um, mm. but it worked out, uh, you know. And, and and then after Sacred Heart, well, while while I was still in school, at the end of my junior year, uh, Kath and I got married, so that was a while back, and. After I graduated, I, I had been drafted, so I went to uh, um, eventually to Greensboro, North Carolina, to work at Guilford College because I had a, a, was a conscience objector and worked in Greensboro there two years and also worked at UNCG in the same status on the uh, um, housekeeping crew. And uh, from there to Richmond, Virginia for a year, not quite sure why we moved to Richmond, just because we thought it would be a good idea. And then from Richmond to Passaic, New Jersey. I moved to Passaic um, because when I was still in school in, in Belmont, uh, Kath and I would drive, uh, get on a bus, the local bus and go to Charlotte. And we worked at a place called McDonald Art Gallery which was on Providence Road at the time. It's no longer there. I think there's maybe a, a, a Bank of America branch where it was now. But, um, and we did picture framing for McDonald's. And they were one of the, one of the few so-called contemporary art galleries in town at that time. That's where, you know, where I first saw the work of Herb Jackson Mm -hmm. My wife Laura was there and that was, it was a while back and and so that was a very helpful experience but but um, when we were in Richmond they they had become affiliated with a, an artist from Chapel Hill a printmaker by the name of Stephen White mm -hmm. I framed a lot of his things when I was in Charlotte but 
uh, he became affiliated with a, a design company in New York, in New Jersey, and they were looking for someone. And so Mac, the McDonald's at the gallery recommended me through Stephen White. And so I went to New Jersey um, to work for a wall accessory company, um, which um, for a couple of years there in Passaic, outside of New York. And um, their, their biggest buyer was Bloomingdale's. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I helped make all the models for the, the market. And I would hang Bloomingdale's both, both on 59th Street and out on Long Island. And I would go down to High Point a couple times a year and hang the show at their Coggin, who we showed with in High Point. And, you know, I, the experience was good because, you know, we probably got into New York more than most people in New Jersey. And so from that standpoint, it was good. But it also taught me, I think, a great deal about uh, materials. And I, I think to this day, one reason why I work in series is because at, when I was working for the wall accessory company, I, I, uh, I made multiples of everything the same size uh, from and that was the way we made things. So I, I still do that to this yeah. day, generally speaking. Um, and so that was an important experience. And from there, uh, Kath kept encouraging me to go back to graduate school. And so the only place I could get into on a provisional basis was uh, USC in Columbia. And that was, that was pretty neat. Um, there was, I remember there was someone else there on a provisional basis. That was Gene Gallagher, who ended up being the chair at um, Converse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she went on, she was uh, ended up in California for a long time. She's back in South Carolina now. And then Bill Dooley was there. He was uh, at the Light Factory for a while. He's now at the uh, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, the gallery director there. And there were other people too. It was a, it was an interesting time. So those three years were were pretty good. I I I really enjoyed. I took advantage of graduate school in every way I could. And um, I I decided after I'd been there a year to look into two degrees. So I got a degree also in applied art history as well as the MFA mm -hmm. in painting. And that's how I became involved in um, working with. Uh, so-called outsider artist. Uh, when I was at, at USC in, in the late 70s, I, my thesis for the applied art history was to assemble an exhibition of outsider artists in the Carolinas. And um, it opened eventually at the uh, Columbia Museum, I think in 1980, and also traveled to the Charleston History Museum, perhaps. Wow. And so that was that was pretty neat. But because of that, I I ended up in Arkansas with my first teaching job at a place called Arkansas College, which is now Lyon College. And um, they had two things they wanted me for to help head an internship program in historic preservation. And the other thing was um, to begin an art program. And so I was there for three years. And um, wow. Maggie was born in Batesville, Arkansas. And then the irony is from Arkansas, this little town um, right on the edge of the Ozarks, you go from the Delta into the Ozarks. Um, I went to Miami to <laughs> Barry University. So that was like, you know, total flip and flop and going to Miami for a couple of years. Wow. Which also was quite interesting. So, um, and then from Miami to um, Salisbury, North Carolina, to the Waterworks Visual Arts Center, I was there for five years. And that was the longest we'd ever lived in one place, five years, but it was, it was all right. Matthew was born in Salisbury. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there to um, um, Rock Hill, mm -hmm. where I've been for, uh, 30 years. It's amazing. Great place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that I, 
I think would be great uh, for you to tell us a little bit about is um, your work to me also, not only is it very much about working in series, but there's this strong element of drawing in the work, even though your, your work is, that I think you produce most of all, that we all know are paintings, but it's kind of like you're drawing in a sense with paint. Uh, and then there's the element of the sgraffito. So I, I think it would be interesting to know, like, as a kid, where did, w were you drawing a lot? Um, what kind of things were you drawing? I know that you um, have this um, history with architectural and mechanical drawings. Mm -hmm. um, well, sure, there are a couple of things. I was always interested in mechanical drawing because when we lived, in Concord and also in Harrisburg. My, my father worked at a machine shop called R.H. Bullany Company, which I think is still in Charlotte. Um, and so on some Saturdays when he had to go to work, I would go with him as a little kid. And my job was, he would put me to work um, filing blueprints away. So <laughs> I just thought that was the greatest thing, blueprints. I mean, it's yeah. when they were actually blue. So, mm -hmm. um, so I did that. And so one of my, my goals was to become an engineer at that time. And I kept that idea. But at the same time, I was doing other things. Uh, um, I would make um, signs, I'd paint signs uh, on, on the side of a bus or on buildings for uh, the church where I went. So and, and the priest there was very supportive of me in that sense. Um, so I did a lot of things like that on the side when I was very young and in Boy Scouts and, and beyond that, an altar boy. But um, <laughs> I think the one thing that really stuck with me more than anything else was in high school, I took a couple of years, as you say, mechanical and architectural drafting with, uh, uh, I remember his name with Paul Wentz. I, I don't think he's alive any longer, but that was really an informative time to be able to um, focus on that mechanical aspect of drawing, measuring uh, the geometry that's involved in that and, and um, the beauty of lines. So that, that stuck with me. And, uh, and I continue to use that today. I mean, I, I have a, a, I now call it a painting table. It's like a big drawing table, but you know, I, I can put T squares and triangles directly on my painting so I can work with them in that way. So that has become an, you know, a, a technique or a process that I, I still use a great deal. And uh, it is what it is. And yeah. but I still go, to make it something that I haven't seen before. Yeah, we go to a lot of antique stores. And sometimes I see these beautiful slide rule sets and mm -hmm. cases with little, yeah. little pocket sleeves. And I, I I have a big smile because I think of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's uh, most of my things are covered in paint now, but I still they still work. But yeah, uh, uh, and, and and that's so it goes. But I do think it speaks a lot to um, working with what you know, mm -hmm. learned at some level. I'm sure I learned things in art classes, but this certainly has stuck with me a great deal. Yeah. Is that when you started to see art as a career path, or did that take a little longer to get to? Um, I, I think I saw art as a career path in freshman registration line when, when I found out you could major in art. Oh, and I yeah. saw my major, <laughs> or just decided what my major would be right then and there. And in one way or the other, this sounds really, really strange, but you know, with the exception of working um, in housekeeping at UNCG or Guilford, I've somehow always had my hand in that professionally. I don't, I've just been very lucky, whether it be framing or working in as um, for the wall accessory company. I mean, mm -hmm. it's always, always been there. And those are very, important learning experiences. Uh, yeah. Was this, a, this was at Belmont Abbey, the freshman um, year? Yeah, Belmont Abbey when I- Oh, wow, okay. When I went to Belmont Abbey, 
many years ago. It was a little bit different than it is now. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about that, that is, I, Kath and I went back there a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago. Um, when I was there, I found this huge clacker. I can send you an image of it mm -hmm. under a port of a monastery. And it was a huge thing. You, know, I don't, you may have seen it in my studio. Yeah. Like, but you turn it and it sounded like a machine gun. <laughs> well, that was, that was, I thought I had saved it because it looked like it was discarded under the porch of the monastery. And it probably was. But it, it, it had its origins in Bavaria as used you know, during Lent in lieu of bells to signify the scourging of Christ. And so Kath was after me, Tom, you ought to give it back to the monks. And so we went back and <laughs> gave it back to them. I met the abbot there and all of the above. I mean, it's a, it's a much more conservative place than it was when I was there, but that's okay. It has, it's found its mission. Yeah. 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 Back to Beaumont Abbey. <laughs> that's great. You sent me the photo and, um, and it was just like this thing that I just totally forgot. But I remember whenever I was at Winthrop with you, seeing it in your studio, it was just fascinating. Like, what is that, that yeah. thing? Yeah, well, you know, it, it had uh, had dovetail joints on it. And yeah. it was looked somewhat crude, but it was well made and it still worked. Mm -hmm. you know, it was probably from, you know, the late 19th century when it was mm -hmm. made. But I thought they, they needed it back. And he the, the abbot assured me it would, go in the archives so yeah yeah nice well when you were at belmont abbey you finished your your degree there your bachelor's yes was that what was that in was that in art um yeah it was in art just like general studio or just yeah art? whatever just it was a, just the ba um yeah. and there were you know several teachers there who who i enjoyed it it was also the other students i enjoyed mm -hmm. um the irony is, you probably remember Mary Minich. She was a teacher there at that time. And of course, wow. Sister, uh, Theophane was also there. Mm -hmm. And a woman by the name of Barbara Kastler, who eventually was uh, a mainstay at Central Piedmont. Um, they've all passed away since since yeah. then. But uh, but also there were some of the students. There. That's where I met a good friend named Bob Koff mm -hmm. and his wife, Vicki Koff. Vicki went on to be the director of SICA. Wow. Bob, uh, um, you know, makes furniture and is an excellent designer. Mm -hmm. He stays kind of isolated to himself in, in North Carolina. But nonetheless, it, you know, it was important relationships were made there. Mm. And you never know what will come out of it. The other, another great person I met there was Kitty Couch or Clara Couch, who was a, she took classes with us there and she was, uh, went on to be a phenomenal you know, ceramic artist. Absolutely, yeah. She lived outside of Penland. Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting people for sure. Wow. I mean, one thing that your story has always taught me and I find very, very fascinating and inspiring is you meet people along the way in your life and they become kind of part of your family. Um, you know, like these names that you've just listed from people, uh, mm -hmm. Belmont, um, you know, they, they weren't just passing. And I remember when I was a, a student at Winthrop and working alongside of you, um, you were also treating the, the students kind of like that as peers. And I found that very inspiring that the, um, we weren't just <laughs> Well, they used to do more than I did. So it was very important to be to take advantage of that whenever possible and yeah and um oftentimes if people know that i was at winthrop they often ask well what did you teach and i come back as little as possible because <laughs> I, I thought it was important for the people who really knew the methodology of teaching to be able to do that i i where i might come in is trusting students to to do things that um were important. I, I thought that was, was an, what I tried to do whenever possible. Yeah, preparing everyone for life outside of school because it is going to come to an end at some point and you have to figure out how to, you know, make this work on your own. Yeah, it comes um, to an end. 
but that's yeah. it. I'm, and I'm glad it, for me, it has finally come to an end. So yeah. well, congratulations. <laughs> you know, I, my time there was great. I enjoyed it, but um, my, my administrative uh, knowledge of, of Winthrop is, a, is in a cargo container drifting out to sea. Because <laughs> so, there's so much more, you know, there's a heck of a lot more. And I, and that's also what's, I, I find exciting and keeps me moving in some way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, while you were there, I found it like you were uh, an exhibiting artist. Also, not, not only were you um, the director of the gallery, and I was working with you and you were teaching, you know, occasionally here and there and involved with the administration, but you were an exhibiting artist and, and uh, always in your studio painting whenever you weren't there and I, in your office, I mean, and, and I, I, I thought that was so amazing just that you lived and breathed it, you know, being an artist. Because um, you were showing at Hodges Taylor Gallery at the time. I and, think so. Yeah, <laughs> and then you had, you had, uh, I, I, shows that were popping up here and there, I think at the State Museum and the McKissick. Um, but then I remember you had a residency, I think, in New Orleans. Was Well, somehow I finagled, even though as a staff person at the time, with um, faculty rank, I finagled a sabbatical and um, wasn't exactly a residency, but I, I, I went there to do some quote unquote research, um, <laughs> trying to find out some information about my, my grandfather. And, I, and what a great place to do it, I mean, in New Orleans. So I, I did that and I usually stayed, there were a couple of people I stayed with generally. One, one was uh, uh, Debbie Luster, who I knew, uh, she's, I think she's a photographer. And um, another one was um, Anne Boudreaux, who I knew from grad school. So I would often stay there and, I, and just wander around New Orleans and go to the Louisiana room of a public library downtown to do research. So um, from that came um, a series that you may recall, uh, the floating series, boats, that sort of look like Mardi Gras floats. So yeah. it, it came out of um, that time there. Were you working on any of those paintings prior to going to New Orleans? Those the floating not, with not, the boats? Not the not the boats, not the floating series. Okay. But before I went to New Orleans, I would do some paintings that reference that idea, which I called Across the River. And they were um, much more had a lot of wash on them, a lot of uh, drips, a lot of mm -hmm. things. And as well as hard edge imagery and to develop a contrast. But I'd been to New Orleans before, but uh, they just evolved out of what I was thinking about at that time. And a lot of my work early on revolved around um, kind of the, my family history. Um, and, you know, that was fine for then. And I I almost used it as a crutch sometimes, but sometimes something good came out of it. I don't really do that as much anymore. I, I think, um, I've, I've, I don't know whether I've moved on, but I, I, I guess I've, I've done that. And, and, you know, I still remember it and recall it, but now I, I'm thinking more about the specific painting and, and what happens with it, which is basically unknown. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. So, no, that's fabulous. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to attach something else to it that may or may not have a um, real meaning. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it just depends. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of planning involved with your work. I, I, I imagine between the, you're going to work in a series, X number of paintings in that series. They're all going to be this size range and you 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 are obviously very organized in that regard are you keeping a studio i mean excuse me a sketchbook are you are you using a sketchbook a lot of times to sketch draw keep ideas together or is it all that's an interesting idea i wish i did um <laughs> i mean i might make some 
in the middle of the painting, I might draw something out first, but I, I hesitate to say I've never really kept a sketchbook except when I, when I was in school or I had to. And I sometimes felt like I was just doing it because I had to, but um, I hesitate to say I really, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the sketches or the planning occurs directly on, on the canvas or on the paper that I'm, that I'm working on. And um, so that there still becomes a, a hair of uh, immediacy. It's somewhat immediate at some level because it appears that much of my work is so tight sometimes mm -hmm. that it would maybe not be immediate, but there's a lot of mistakes there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I that, mean- that become maybe useful in the process. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. One. So when I, again, when I was at Winthrop with you, I remember I would get out of class, my, my night class that would end at 9.30 and I would make my way to my studio and I'd pass yours and you would have your doors closed and jazz music blaring. And there were times where I could stick my head in your studio if it was open and you were like a jazz musician, just everything like, like just, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, just, just kind of happening um, um, as you went, kind of as you're describing, you're just reacting to what's happening with the paint. And, um, and I find that really interesting. And then that kind of, you were working on that series um, en route to Hamlet at the time, and then you, you were able to tell me a little bit more about that. The Hamlet series? Yeah, tell us yeah. a little bit. Um, yeah, when I when I lived in Salisbury, I also had a, a studio. Well, it was a big garage that I converted into a studio. It was ten feet by thirty feet. So if someone actually built a garage, but um, and I had a record player in there, and so I listened to music quite a bit at that time. And here again, this is relying upon something that becomes my own myth in a way, and I'm not sure that, that it really had meaning, but. And Route to Hamlet, if you recall, was a series of like, uh, they were freezes, or in other words, image after image all in a row that might wrap around the wall, just be a smaller seat, but it was like a freeze. And I would refer to it as a free floating visual narrative. And the, the title in Route to Hamlet was as much of a, how should I put it, kind of a, a romantic way to connect myself to the, to the music. Because um, Hamlet was the, the birthplace of John Coltrane, Hamlet, North Carolina. And you drive through Hamlet, or well, used to drive through Hamlet if you were going to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and, but before you got to Hamlet, uh, just outside of Rockingham was um, a, um, an old textile mill that had burned and most, mostly crumbled to the ground. It was three stories high. You know it's three stories high because that's how many rows of half arched windows were there. Mm -hmm. Every summer the kudzu would climb up that wall and turn it into something else. So it was en route to Hamlet and I often considered it one of the greatest pieces of unintentional public art in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. so, that's what was en route to Hamlet as much as anything, this idea of trying to make something uh, that had meaning. As, and, and so we listened to John Coltrane who had been born in Hamlet and that's really my only connection to him besides listening to that music. The strange thing about it is, um, you know, I would continue to listen to music in, in school and I, I wonder what that was all about was I was just drowning everything else out now I've become very, I've become much more quiet. Oh. And I seldom, I seldom listen to music anymore. Wow, oh, interesting. And, uh, and, and it's not that when I was listening to music that it was negative. It's just that um, I'm somewhere else right now. I, I enjoy the quiet mm. in a strange way. That's great, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I was just gonna ask, how do you think about your work um, because it is representational but 
it's kind of stylized and almost abstract. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, especially as I, um, you know, I've done things that aren't that, and they're hidden away mainly, but it's come to the point that I feel like I have to have a, a recognizable image, an image that people can understand on, on a very immediate way, even though it's very stylized or almost silhouette-like. Usually they're very two-dimensional. Maybe I'll vary from that sometimes, but I want it to be something that people realize so that it's almost like a visual word and 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 um, picture plane becomes uh, an assemblage of visual words that maybe are like a poem, maybe not, but mm -hmm. visually you try to connect them in some way, you recognize them. So maybe something there will, because I'm really interested um, and, and what people can see also and what I can see. And that's why I say, I mean, I don't, sometimes I don't totally get it, what I'm, what I'm doing, because I use a lot of the same images over and over again. I just use them differently. But, but it is important that there's some representational element I, for me right now. Mm -hmm. That could change when I go back upstairs, but right now that has been pretty important. Yeah. The, go ahead. Do you think that's important just in this particular time that we're in where things are especially uncertain or? Um, I, I, I think it helps. I mean, because a lot of people will look at my work and still think that it's quote unquote abstract because it doesn't, you know, look like um, many people's idea of what something that's realistic or representational is. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly fine, but the imagery is still there. And, and a lot of things I bring from things I do recall, like the hog, uh, which is a silhouette, you know, that's, that's taken from, you know, the red pig, you know, which was mm -hmm. a, um, in my hometown. So, you know, the barbecue joint. So yeah. there are images like that that come about that do have some old meaning and that I've used a long time ago as well and they they reappear and i think that's if i have a box of cutouts mm -hmm. that i use as templates for a lot of things and sometimes i have to make them totally from scratch but that's okay and, and um see how we get. but i do think that that's important at some level that there's something concrete to hang your hat on or when you explore something that you can explore in that way that is not to say that a lot of totally abstract paintings are, you know, are, are great. And I like a lot of them, but right now I'm just really interested in making that definition, like that mantle behind you, <laughs> the dental <laughs> going across the, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, that makes some, that means something to someone. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the personal iconography, I think is something that, um, you know, obviously I can relate to in my work, but that series of your Hamlet series is one that, that really spoke to me in particular. Um, just it's like I, when I was in college and I would go home to see my parents or my grandparents. And, and at the time my, my grandparents were in their last, um, you know, lag of yeah. life and, and driving down these isolated roads in um, rural South Carolina and seeing these signs and advertisements or shells of structures. And sometimes it is just a silhouette or a shape. Um, and it, but it's very, very, there's a sense of isolation about it. And you're kind of with your thoughts in a, in a way. So you're kind of like these, these visual chapters of life. And um, that series really spoke well, that, you know, you're right. There's a lot of imagery out there that has a lot of meaning to it. it it's it becomes so crowded that it's more difficult to see, I think, than at one time. So trying to isolate it out becomes. Mm -hmm. But what you, what was interesting about that series is it really evolved from an earlier series, um, a slide script series, which is much more colorful and looks like the images are just placed all over the place. But then in, in route to Hamlet, 
I took images from there and isolated them on a single panel and used a lot of symmetry mm -hmm. as well um, in, in that respect. So yeah. that, that was important in that series, yeah. And there may be a word sometimes, like there, a single yeah. word. Words are important. Yeah. 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 So um, I guess, unless you had another question, there was one, um, I think I wanted to see if you would tell us a little about your use of Scrafito, your technique of Scrafito. Yeah. And, um, um, and define that a little bit for us, because that's something very, like, a Tom Stanley painting has a lot of different icons and different layers, but you can kind of recognize it through a lot of the mark making that you use. Well, Scrivito, um, there are some tools that I, I have <clears throat> that um, I've used, and it, it may be because I discovered this tool and accidentally used it one day to scratch into paint, but it's an old graphic design tool. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has a hard probably stainless steel point on it, so it still works uh, in in wet paint. Mm -hmm. And so I use it a lot. And what I've discovered, it, but the paint has to be just um, consistency has to be just so so for it to work. It has to dry a little bit before it works. Um, and it's it's become a useful tool because it also not only can you create additional images by scratching into wet paint. But also you can create values and textural qualities, which I enjoy. And also, it is the, the, the scraffito might be in a hard edge, you know, well-defined um, area, and then the scraffito comes along and makes it much more informal. Uh, and I, you know, I'm just looking at some things right now which are have scraffito in them. And it's like an immediate drawing because it has a lot of energy, hopefully some energy in it because you have to do it before the paint dries. And that provides, you know, that juxtaposition between you know, the mechanical drawing mm. element, the masking off element, and then this drawing into wet paint, which you have to do very quickly. And so you don't, it's almost as if you, well, you think about it, but the thought press process is much more, um, I won't say unconscious, but it's much more immediate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rembrandt actually used some of that too with um, like the end of a paintbrush in areas mm -hmm. of hair or in a beard, yeah. if you look closely at it. Um, but you use it in a wonderful way to kind of show through another layer or even define a shape sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I I enjoy it to be able to use it. Um, sometimes it 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 changes changes the painting mm -hmm. for sure. Um, Are you painting in acrylics when you do that? Yeah, I paint in acrylic, and okay. and I I I dilute the acrylic, and I put them in jars till till it's about a milkshake consistency. I might put medium in it to make it shiny or dull. But so it's about a milkshake consistency. I don't use it necessarily straight from the tube. I, I want it to lie flat, as flat as possible yeah. on, the, on the canvas or on the paper in mm -hmm. that respect. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 Well, you had another question. Yeah, um, kind of going back, um, you've spoken about all the different careers you've had in the arts, but of course you've kept your studio practice through all that. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you personally balance those two spheres of your life. Between ad administration and studio? Yeah. Kind of thing? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I, I got to the point, and I think that's why I was, I was fortunate. That, that's why Winthrop was, was a good thing. Um, a lot of people might not agree with me and there was and if they had been chair, but you know, I could <laughs> if you have keys to everything, it helps. Um or as the gallery director, if if I wasn't doing my own work, I didn't feel like it was worth it. Um and so I I certainly tried to make time to do my, my work, even 
and also I was very fortunate that you know I, I sometimes go home, go back to the studio after dinner and I go there and, and work for a couple hours and then come back home. So Kath helped you know some things down here oftentimes which I was very fortunate for and so but it was very important that I, I keep working at some level. Um, it helped me understand artists who I might be working with in the gallery. Uh, maybe they could understand me a little bit as well. But I, I and, and it also it influenced when I, when I would curate shows, so to speak, um, or organize them. They have some inkling of, of how to make things or what an artist might go through to make something. I thought that became an important part of, of why I selected artists. And then as a, a chair, you know, if I wasn't making work, why should I encourage students to make work? So um, that became part of it as yeah. well. And there was a time, I, I always get these histories mixed up. You may have been gone by then, Chris, but you know, I, I filled up the studio. So I started working on the outside walls um, outside my studio and I would fill them up with a series of paintings and and work with them out there and get on the ladder or whatever I mean students would walk by and they'd be there and and I I thought that was pretty cool I wasn't intimidated by that I hope they weren't because you know I was working and I'd leave mm -hmm. them there and come back the next night and start working on them again and and hopefully people noticed if they would change um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As time went on, I kind of enjoyed that. Uh, now I'm not doing that, of course, because environment uh, changes everything about how you work and when you work. And uh, so I'm in a totally different environment right now. So, but it, it was it was very important that I try to work, and because my, one of my goals always was, and this is, I, I kept this always in the back of my mind, that someday I'm gonna be an artist. I still feel that way. That someday, you know, I'll be an artist. And, and if you're not working at it at some level, you know, it's not gonna happen. It's just like, I mean, that's one thing. And also someday I'm gonna, you know, you know I'm gonna be a good person. <laughs> I'll be a part of that. It's like you think about these things and you, you have to keep working at them it's at some level to, to make it work. And when I say that now, I think my idea of what an artist is and, and could be or should be has also changed or evolved. So I'm constantly toying with that idea also, what it means to be making work now. Mm. And in this environment, you know, at my age, at, you know, here, at home in this place and you know, it's trying to make it work. So that's become important to me as well, to, to consider all of those ideas. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow, beautifully stated. Yeah. Yeah, no, you, you've inspired so many students and other people in life. I, I know, you know, I'm certainly one, but yeah, the students at Winthrop, just seeing how hard you were working, how committed you were to your artwork and, um, and even having that full-time job, you were still there, you know, working harder than anyone else and exhibiting. And your work, I, I just, I thought it was beautiful. There was a certain, um, a feeling of warmth about the work, I remember, that um, that really kind of, kind of stood out to me. And I think that you're a very warm person as well. And it kind well of sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, I hope it's always changing. Um, at some level, um, going from there, and you never know. But the other thing I think it's important is not to be afraid to to make it as right as you can. You know the work, and sometimes the even the canvases I'd be working out in the hall, I get to a point that this isn't working, so I I would take them down to the wood shop and sand them down and start over mm -hmm. if I needed to, and and that was okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was totally okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, one a, a, a series I worked on that I framed up not long ago. There's um, twelve works on on arches. What was it called? Um, untitled attic drawings. Mm -hmm. um, I'd worked on those 
I when I, oh, it was, it was after McCall. I came home and I said, I need to work on something. I need to keep working. So I started on those 12 pieces of, of paper arches, which I treat like a painting. And what is a painting? And I, I worked on it for a long time every day. And, and then Kath and I went on a vacation. I think we went, drove up to Montreal and did some other things. And somewhere along the road, I thought back and said, something's not working about any of those. And I don't know what they looked like then. But when I got back, I sanded them all down and started over. Mm. And, and I kept working on them. And, and it was almost as every day I'd go work on them. And it was like, I still thought something's not right about these. And I kept working on them. And I wouldn't look at, the, at them until I was finished the whole thing. And I finished all 12 of them. And I had them shot. And then I started looking at them again. And I said, well, they're okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I, because I think it's part of it is just working at it um, mm -hmm. to discover things. If you, don't, if you don't work at it a little bit every day, you don't discover anything. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you make a mis something that, that's not right, maybe it'll be right later. Maybe you don't know. So to me, that has become the thing what I enjoy about this practice as much as anything is not knowing. Mm. So. I love it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So um, what's, do you have anything on the horizon now? Are you working towards any exhibition or um, potential residency or, well, no. well tell yeah. us, or I mean, go into that, whatever you're going to say, but I know we definitely want to talk about public art too, but please okay. continue. Yeah, I'm not um, working towards an exhibition that I'm aware of right now. There might be something somewhere, but I, I can't recall. But um, the things I'm I'm working right now on, a, well, it'll end up being nine uh, panels. They're not huge, but uh, they're not nice. They're uh, 22 by 28. Uh, I remember that's a standard glass size, but um, <laughs> things you pick up along the way. <laughs> no, anyway, but um, and I'm just working on, and I I don't know totally where they're going. Um, I wanted they follow a little upon the last work I did, and then again they don't. So I'm just seeing where the, where they go. I, I my goal here is to be able to work on them. Uh, and look at them as individual pieces as opposed to just nothing but a series, but they'll still be a series, but to see how they can change and how uh, I work on them maybe differently and think about them as I go from one to the next. And I try not to look at them when I think I'm at a particular finishing point and then go on to the next. And I I'm just trying to see what happens um, with that. And, and when I finish them, and then I might propose something somewhere and go from there. Um, How do you know when a series is finished? Um, that's a good question. I, I think when you can look back, okay. And, you, and when, when you no longer want to add anything to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. That might be it. Because I do think those that I thought I finished are the ones I'm working on right now. I, can, I see other things in them occasionally. And mm -hmm. Go back and put something else there. Um, if they if they seemed they seemed too planned or, or too you know con uh, self conscious, I know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so I got to be careful about that as well. Wow. That's one is trying. I mean, that's kind of a contradiction. Trying not to be self conscious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, it's somewhat true. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, you've worked on um, a couple of public art projects, like with the light rail, and I think you have a current one, um, uh, another piece in process now. Uh, could you tell us about some of the the um, benefits and things you've learned while working on the public art project? And yeah, sure. Uh, I, yeah. Um, 
One of my colleagues that went through got me involved in public art because of a, a show I had at the Carillon building, which he and other people said look like public art. I said, okay, well, let me get it. So, mm -hmm. so I um, began working with Sean Cassidy on some things. And we actually had a studio together for a while, a uh, huge place. Um, was that in Rock Hill down at the yeah, Coca-Cola? No, it was, no. Uh, I can't remember where it was. It was yeah. going on the way out of Rock Hill and, and these, you know, those industrial prefab buildings. Mm -hmm. We rented one for a while when we were working on uh, the Winthrop Monolith. Mm -hmm. um, not that we made anything there. We actually just did painting and other stuff while we were in this space. But mm -hmm. it got me involved in that. And then I enjoyed it because I enjoyed the collaboration. We did some other collaborative things. We did a collaborative exhibition once and I really enjoyed it. And when, when it was time to, we had a grant to do a little small catalog. We collaborated on the, on the text of the catalog. He would say a phrase and I would say a phrase. He would say a phrase. And that's what the text of the catalog became. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And and so we I I enjoyed that, but I enjoyed working collaboratively with him because we could share ideas and actually accepted each other's ideas, which was I thought pretty neat. Uh, and so that's how I got involved in in public art. And we did we did something um, in Matthews for a big soccer field. Oh, we did a big piece in Raleigh. Uh, and some other things, something in Somerville. And then we got involved in the light rail. We started together, but then they separated us, but that still worked out pretty well because Katz was involved and they were very well organized and kept, um, kept the artist in tow, which, which I, I found very helpful. I'm now working on a similar, somewhat similar project in that um, it's, an infrastructure improvement project that the city of Charlotte is doing along Tom Hunter Road, which mm -hmm. is part of the Hidden Valley neighborhood. And my light rail station, the Tom Hunter station, serves the Hidden Valley neighborhood. So my project is supposed to be a wayfinding project to create connectivity between the neighborhood and the light rail station, even though it's not a CATS project, a mm -hmm. Charlotte area transit project. It's an uh, arts and science council project. But I got cats involved because yeah. I, I, um, the one thing I saw that wasn't on Tom Hunter Road were um, there were bus stops, but there weren't bus shelters. Mm -hmm. So um, I proposed something that's not very, you know, um, <clears throat> artistic, <laughs> functional bus shelters. <clears throat> and so, mm -hmm. you know, I'll have some. Uh, imagery on it from the um, light rail. Mm -hmm. And it will also have phrases um, from the community um, about how they feel about Hidden Valley. Yeah, so, I think that's uh, wonderful. Yeah, it's that and it will be some other things. I'm trying to expand the project and I'll, I'll have a meeting with the Hidden Valley Community Association next Tuesday. And I've been to a number of those meetings, not like they do, but um, but I'll tell them where we are on the project. And I also want to introduce the idea of a video that basic cable would do. Mm -hmm. Another couple of former students from, from Winthrop. Sure. Because um, they did a video uh, for the light rail project mm -hmm. and it took out very well. So I want to expand upon that and want it to be something that would be for the um, for the neighborhood. Um, I think of public art, at least my limited involvement in it is it needs to be for the stakeholders, mm -hmm. not by the stakeholders as much as possible. I feel like I'm just administering this as best I can and moving the money around to make where it make, might make sense mm -hmm. and finding ways to, you know, that it'll come together. One of the individuals who's working with me on this project was one of the students I worked with at uh, MLK Middle School, which is in Hidden Valley. I worked there and also at the elementary school to students wrote poems and text and, and students at the elementary school 
actually made cutouts of silhouettes of houses that all became part of the, of the light rail project in some way. Mm. And so unique pattern is the young lady who's working with me, um, who worked on when she was in, at MLK Middle. And she's now at NC State. And so uh, I find that exciting. I'm trying to give her more responsibility as we go through this project and, and see how she responds to that. And I think she's doing really well. And if nothing else, if she comes out on the other end, you know, having learned something and makes a difference uh, as she continues, um, you know, in, in her career path, that'll be enough. She lives in Hidden Valley, has lived there for about 10 years with her mom and grandmother. And um, she helped inspire the idea of the bus shelters as we would walk up and down Tom Hunter Road and noticed that there weren't any bus shelters and yeah. her family doesn't have a car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to think, wow, you know, this, you know, this makes sense in a way to give, uh, to provide some shelter from the storm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the name of the project, Shelter from the Storm, which uh, mm. uh, you could either say that comes from the Bible or from Bob Dylan, depending. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so it, it's, you know, I, I, I leave it up to the, them so it's um I, I have to admit i mean I'm, I'm i want the project to work and be successful for everyone involved but it will probably be my last public art project just because of the um time and energy that it does consume and i'm kind of at a point where i want to monitor my energy and my time mm -hmm. and be able to you know when we can travel again do that and, and also be in the studio and without like, you know, interruption for a while. Mm. Just those things I think it's kind of neat. So I'm trying to whittle away at my extracurricular activity. So to speak. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I know that one other thing we need to touch on um, for sure is uh, you mentioned the, your love of outsider art um, mm -hmm. from your days. In graduate school and you've had many projects that you've juggled and many artists um, careers that you've worked with al along the outsider art um, movement um, I'd love it if you could just tell us a few words about some of some of those experiences yeah I almost forgot <laughs> yeah me too wait a minute because that's a big part of yeah, it's a big, it's, it's an important part of what I did. I, I worked on some exhibitions when I was at Winthrop, in fact. I got involved um, with Pearl Fryer's Topiary Garden mm -hmm. on their board for a while and found that very interesting. It was in his film. Um, and I worked with the State Museum on revisiting the exhibition I did for the Columbia Museum. Mm -hmm. and, Columbia Museum exhibition was called Worth Keeping, Bound the Artists of the Carolinas. And this one was called Still Worth Keeping. Um, and so and it, it was an expanded exhibition. And obviously, they had more funds and resources uh, to do some things. So um, I enjoyed that. Uh, what I enjoyed more than anything was when, it, when the artists were still alive, visiting with the artists and getting a sense of what they were about and how they got to where they they uh, they arrived in the making of their work and their statements, and just kind of getting a clue for that. And I, I have to admit, most of them um, used the resources that they had, uh, what they knew, materials that were readily available, uh, and made just fascinating objects or environments, depending, <clears throat> and that has influenced me a great deal. I certainly am not interested in making work like them. I'm really interested in their attitudes towards making and, and living that has been important to me. Um, one artist I've worked with a great deal, who I, I, the secretary or the administrative assistant in the uh, dean's office told me about back in, after I arrived at Winthrop back in 19, 90 and I she told me about him a couple of years later was uh, Jean Merritt because her her daughter was um, a waitress 
at Watkins Grill when it was downtown on Main Street. And so uh, I, I got to know Gene Merritt who would go there every day and draw until lunchtime and then he left before it, it got crowded. Uh, so I got to know him pretty well and remained close to Gene until his death. And in fact, became his um, legal guardian for a while, court ordered guardian because of his health. Um, and so that, that was a unique experience for sure. Um, Gene would call me up five in the morning. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, I got paperwork. And so uh, it's what he called his drawings, his paperwork. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was obligated to go over and, and buy paperwork from Gene. And that was kind of a relationship we had. And then I introduced Gene to other people who became involved in his work as well. Um, the collection of Lord Root in Lausanne. Mm -hmm. I sent the curator there one of his drawings once. I met her at Black Mountain at a so-called conference. And I sent her a drawing of Gene's just for just thought I'd give it. A, well, she was on a plane not too long after that back over here to, wow. to meet mm -hmm. Gene. And eventually they brought a photographer over to follow him around for a number of days. Because um, there aren't as many artists um, who, who, work, who were working like Gene, who really had no outside art influence. You know, he had a lot of outside influences, mainly television, mm -hmm. um, popular culture, but not necessarily mainstream art influences. And that was very important. And that was one thing the collection of Lark Root functioned upon in, in their collection was artists who, you know, had no outside influence with regard to the art world. <clears throat> so that was Gene. And so he had a one person show there, he had one in Tokyo. In other places, I don't even know every, everywhere else yeah. at this point in time. But yeah, I've worked with him, and I've uh, I'm getting ready to. <laughs> that's another thing I have to check off my to do list. I, I I'm giving them um, all the early drawings of his work that I have because it's not going to be any good, but yeah. they'll be able to use them in a way and can share them with other people. So I have to catalog them for them before I send them over. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's neat to be able to, to do that little by little, but that work had a, you know, a big impact on, on how I, th I think as much how I think, or maybe how I want to think. Like I said, you can't be an outsider artist. I can't at, at this point in time, but I can be, look at the, look at their humanness and try to figure out what is, how I can be as human and and their and my working practices as they oftentimes were. Yeah. I mm -hmm. I remember when I was at Winthrop with you, we did a few projects with Studio Eleven up mm -hmm. in Morganton and there was some amazing artists there. And, yeah, they, uh, they certainly were. Um, just, yeah. Yeah. And I've seen yeah. a few of those artists at Hickory Museum now in their collection. Yeah, I remember one of the artists um was also had a one person show in Lausanne. Mm. Um, from there, and that was fun. Wow! Is <laughs> um, also in Tokyo. I, I, so I, I benefited from the fact that I knew these artists and was asked to go places to speak about them, or maybe write a paragraph or two, and that was really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, to be able to do that um, as well. So. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it was an important thing. And I think that that evolved from the fact that uh, growing up, you know, in a small town, mm -hmm. small town then, Concord, mm -hmm. yeah, you see people all around you who make important differences who are overlooked. And I, I found that to be uh, important to, to look more closely at people who oftentimes we might otherwise overlook and see what they have to offer. And so that was kind of my social thing. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. Powerful statement. And I think you've certainly lived your life that way in many different levels. Yeah.
I probably overlooked a few people. <laughs> <laughs> well, any questions on your part? I think I'm good. That was great. Wow. Okay. Amazing, Tom. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, it's it's been my pleasure. It helps me think, especially talking to you all. It helps me think a great deal. Yeah. Good. I spend most of my day not necessarily thinking about this, but you know, going on to what's next. Yeah. Seeing what's yeah. worked. Well, if you ever just need some interaction, we can hop on the computer and have a conversation and show each other what's in the studio on the easel or the yeah, table. Yeah, we'll sometime. Like I, I don't think anybody's seen what I'm doing now, but I'll we'll do it on a computer sometimes when I get to a, feel like one is in question that would be great I don't, you know i'm not trying to get it out there yet but i yeah i don't know why but nonetheless i understand so. completely yeah all right my friend well i guess this is that's a good place to end it this was great thank yeah. you so much until we meet again <laughs> <laughs>